Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Welcome to Calvary Chapel Plantation. If you are with us for the first time, let me extend to you a special welcome. We're glad that you decided to join us this weekend. Uh, my name is Chris Basilici. I get to serve here as the campus pastor, and we are a regional campus of Calvary Fort Lauderdale, one church, many locations and cities. We actually go there sometimes for our teaching. Today we're staying here as we're kicking off the Gospel of Mark. So if you got a Bible or a Bible app, now is the time to open it up. Going to keep it real simple for you guys this morning. Just one place, Mark chapter 1. We're going to look at the first 20 verses. And as you find your way there, a couple quick announcements. One of those being this weekend, every first weekend of the month, uh, we kind of all put on this same t-shirt to communicate the same message of get in the story. We believe that God is still writing his story here in South Florida, and he's graciously invited all of us to be a part of it. And so uh, if you are new to our church and you've been coming maybe for the past few weeks or months, or even you joined us last year, uh, we really encourage people to get involved uh, in our Connect experience. And here's all it is. Four classes that really tell you who we are as a church. It shares the story of Calvary Chapel, and it also gives you the opportunity to share your story and find out how those two stories intersect. So if you've never been able to be a part of those, our next round is getting ready to kick off uh, this month on the 17th, Wednesdays at 6.30 p.m. Uh, all you got to do is go online to calvaryftl.org, look for the Plantation Campus, and sign up for that. Uh, but again, that's starting this month on the 17th. Also, I, I do this sometimes to make sure you're paying attention. If you're a man, raise your hand. Okay, good job. So uh, you saw on the announcements, we're having a men's event coming up at the end of the month. I'm really excited about that. I hope you guys decide to join us. But this week on Thursday, 5.30 p.m. here at this campus, we'll be having our regular men's study together. Guys, we feed you. Sometimes that's the thing that gets you there. That's okay. Hope you stay around for the study. We're going through the book of James. Um, so hope you join us for that. And we make it real easy. You don't have to sign up or register just show up. So that is this Thursday, 5.30 p.m. here at Plantation. So you have your Bibles open. Um, let me forewarn you, I may offend you today a couple times, um, but I just want to say this. My goal is never to offend. My goal is to rightfully present this. And, and it happens sometimes. Like you just you don't expect to come to church every weekend and just leave feeling all great about yourself because part of the process of following Jesus is him changing us and saying, hey, you see that there in your life? Like, that's got to change, and, and I'll give you the grace to do that. And so my prayer has been, man, if I say anything today that doesn't represent God rightly, that it would fall to the ground. Um, but if there's something in there that we need to hear, that we would receive it and understand it and grasp it. Um, and we can't do any of that without his help. So let's pray before we get into his word. Father, we love you and we thank you that we can approach you this morning boldly as sons and daughters. I pray that we would never take that for granted. I pray that we would never get used to worshiping you. That we would no longer be moved as we sing about your son. And so I pray for our hearts today. I pray that if they've grown cold or even lukewarm, that you would start a fire in us again for Jesus. I pray that you would help us to, to hear well, that you would open our ears to hear your words, not mine. Father, that you'd help me to speak well, to say and rightly represent you. But we want to give this time to you, and we want to not just give this time to you, but ourselves to you. And so we ask for your help, we ask for your spirit, for your presence, your power, all of it, and we ask for it in Jesus' name. Amen. So for the next six months, we're going to be looking at the Gospel of Mark. I'm really excited about that. The, the heart of it is looking at who is Jesus. And if you're new to the Bible, you're like, Gospel, what is it? Well, the word Gospel simply means good news. And when you get into the New Testament, what you find are these four different books, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and they are referred to as the Gospels. Four different authors, all telling you basically the same story from different perspectives. They're looking at the life of Jesus, and some of the authors, Matthew and John, they actually walked with Jesus, but Mark and Luke, they kind of came along afterwards and did some investigative reporting and talked to people that were actually there. And we're going to take time over the next six months to look specifically at the Gospel of Mark. And so I want to give you some context for those of you that like context. Mark was written to the Roman church. 
written to the Roman church, and his heart was to express and communicate that Jesus was the suffering servant who ministers on our behalf. That's the message he's trying to get across. The Gospel of Mark is actually the very first gospel that was ever written and put to paper. And out of every story or printed story or book in the world, the Gospel of Mark is the most printed story in all of history. It's the shortest of all the four Gospels. It moves quick. It's like an action movie. Mark will use the word immediately over 40 times. Immediately, immediately, immediately. And for as much as we're going to look at what's in the Gospel of Mark, it's good to also notice what's not in the Gospel of Mark. There's no genealogy. There's no miraculous birth. There's no Sermon on the Mount. Very few parables. It's not so much about the teachings of Jesus. It's about his life, who he was, and what he did. But who is this guy? Who is Mark? I don't see him in the 12 apostles. I mean, who's Mark? Well, John Mark is his full name. And if you read the book of Acts, you find a guy named Barnabas. Barnabas is an encourager. And when, when Saul, this guy Saul, who's persecuting the church and killing Christians, he gets radically saved by Jesus, he becomes Paul, changes his name. And then he goes to kind of be a part of the church. But as you would expect, the church is like, uh, you were just killing us and now you want to be part of us? No, thanks. But Barnabas says, no, 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 I I see God is doing something in this guy. And he becomes an advocate for him. And they become like really good friends. Well, Barnabas is Mark's cousin. And so Barnabas and Paul and Mark, they go on a missionary journey. And it starts out really great. But about halfway through, Mark deserts them, leaves them, goes back home. And this does something in Paul. So that later on, when Barnabas and Paul are getting ready to go on another missionary journey. Barnabas says, hey, let's bring Mark again. And Paul says, "Uh, no thanks. He's a sellout. He left us. I don't want him coming with us. And now these two best friends are in such a heated argument that they actually go their separate ways. But something so cool happens towards the end of Paul's life, 2 Timothy 4.11. You can look at it later. Paul is writing a letter from prison, and he says to Timothy, hey, would you make sure when you come see me, would you bring Mark? There's this restoration and healing of a relationship. And we won't find it in the Bible, but church history tells us that Mark was actually the interpreter for the apostle Peter. And so when we read the gospel of Mark, you've got to understand that most of this is from Peter's perspective. He's telling Mark all the things that happened. The audience is the persecuted church in Rome, and, and this is where maybe I offend some of you, because the word persecution gets thrown around a lot lately, and I want to just kind of paint the picture for what persecution looks like then. Emperor Nero is in control, and in 64 AD, a fire hits Rome, burns things down. Nero hates the Christians. He's looking for an opportunity to kind of take them out. And so what he does, he blames the fire on the Christians and begins to persecute the church. And I don't mean persecution by, like, closing the doors of places that they worship. I mean taking skins of wild animals and covering them with that and kind of like, hey, go run, and then releasing wild dogs that would chase them down and kill them. I mean taking Christians and dipping them in oil and using them as candles to light his garden. That's persecution. You know, like sometimes people will say, I'm starving. I I think most of us have never starved, but I I get what you're saying. This was persecution. And this was the audience that Paul was writing to. Terrible person in leadership. They're losing their freedoms. They're being persecuted. What do you think they need to hear about? Well, let me set you guys up. Who do you think they need to hear about? Jesus. And I think it's important, especially, and sometimes I can be almost like a Pharisee with the word of God, because here's all I know is that in church history, the church starts to kind of lose their way when they lose their way from this. And so what I see in the Bible is that when society looks like it's falling apart and the church feels persecuted, do you know what Mark doesn't write? Hey, you guys need to start like a riot and revolt, picket, make Jerusalem great again. No, he says, turn your eyes to Jesus. 
And if we could just look at God's word and react and respond in ways that the Bible tells us, and I think we'd get along so much better. I'm sorry if I offended you. So, <laughs> they needed to hear about Jesus. And so he writes to the church, and, and look what he says in verse 1. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. The beginning of the gospel. See, I think sometimes we simplify the gospel to the cross of Jesus Christ. The cross is essential and important to the gospel, but it is not the gospel in totality. And it's an important part. I mean, we should ask, man, why did Jesus have to die? I mean, really, why did he have to suffer and die like that on the cross? A big word that we throw around in Christianity, but it is the truth. It's called substitutionary atonement. The idea that someone must pay for sins. You see, as much as God is a loving and gracious and kind God, he's also a just judge. So in any courtroom that you would ever go to on this earth, if someone stood in that courtroom before a judge and they were guilty, well, they would have to pay for that crime. But if a judge looked at someone who was guilty and says, you know what, I'm really kind, don't worry about it, go your way, you would think that's an unjust judge. And so from the very beginning, there is this system put in place, if someone sins, someone has to pay. And so you see the sacrificial system in the Old Testament where someone sins and they bring an animal to the temple and the sacrifice of that animal covers their sin. But that temple and those sacrifices were all pointing ahead to something and someone greater. Who is it? Jesus. All of those lambs were pointing ahead to the Lamb of God who would not cover sin but take away the sin of the world. And, and how humbling it is when someone pays for your mistakes. You ever have someone pay for your mistakes or take the blame for something that you did so you didn't have to pay for it? Jesus did that for us. Every day he does that for us. He took away our sin. He brought peace between us and the Father. But that's not the whole gospel. And that's not where Mark starts. He says the beginning, and he gets right into the life of Jesus. Because just as important to the gospel as his death is his life. I mean, think about it. Why didn't Jesus just fast forward to the cross? I mean, why did he have to do the whole Christmas thing and be born in a manger and, and grow up as a human being and just go through all the suffering and pain of his life and be betrayed? Like, why not just show up to the cross, pay our debt, and make your way to heaven? Because his life was important. The life that he lived for us, well, I'll say this. In the same way that he took our place on the cross in his death, he also took our place by his life on this earth. Because as he paid our debt on the cross, he lived a life that we couldn't live, a life of perfection that actually gets us into heaven. You see, the cross is only half the story. It kind of wipes out all your debt. It starts you at ground zero again, but you've got to be perfect to get to heaven. And so his life is just as important. And so the title of today's message is Jesus is the gospel in the flesh. Jesus is the gospel in the flesh that when you put flesh on something, it means you make it clear. You kind of add detail to it, and that was the life of Jesus. So let's go back to Mark chapter 1. We'll start again in verse 1. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as it is written in the prophets, Behold, I send my messenger before your face who will prepare your way before you. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. John came baptizing in the wilderness and preaching a baptism of repentance for the remission or forgiveness of sins. Then all the land of Judea and those from Jerusalem, they went out to him and they were all baptized by him in the Jordan River, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist and he ate locusts and wild honey. And he preached saying, there comes one after me who is mightier than I whose sandal strap I am not worthy to stoop down and loose. I indeed baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. How did Jesus put flesh on the gospel? Well, the first point, if you're a note taker, Jesus is God's promise kept. Jesus is God's promise kept. 
You see, all through the Old Testament, it's filled with pictures of God's people rebelling and turning their backs on him, and then you find repercussions and you find judgments. And some people say, oh, I don't like the God of the Old Testament. I like Jesus, though. Well, I've got news for you. They're one and the same. And all throughout that time, though, what you see is these promises, these whispers of something that's coming in the future, this Savior, this Redeemer, this Messiah. God had a plan, and he made some promises, but they were a long time coming. And so he says, I'm going to send a Redeemer, but I'm also going to send a herald, a forerunner, to come before him. Because in those days, when a king would make his way into any town, he would send this emissary before him that would announce his coming. And so it was with Jesus. It wasn't just a promise of a Savior. It was a promise of a forerunner. And those are the verses that you see there in verse 2 and 3 that Mark is quoting. That there would be this forerunner, this person making the way straight for Jesus, preparing everyone for his coming, enter John the Baptist. He comes out of the wilderness. I mean, I think he probably kind of looks like a crazy Bob Ross. Like, do you know who Bob Ross is? I, I, it's not biblical. Like, you're not going to find that in the Bible. That's just me. Like, don't quote me. But, like, comes out. He's got camel hair and all just crazy. And he looks like a prophet from the Old Testament. He looks like Elijah. And he's preaching this message, repent and be baptized. Not one of the most popular messages and probably one you don't always necessarily hear in churches today. Repent. What you're doing isn't right. And yet somehow, some way, people are flocking to him. In the wilderness, they're all coming out to him. Baptize us, please. They're confessing their sins. And it's not that baptism saves you. It was basically preparing people's hearts to say, we're not right and we need help. Come and be baptized and confess your sins. But remember, it wasn't all about John. And man, he's probably one of like my favorite people in the Bible because he just wants to get out of the way so people can see Jesus. He's always pointing people back to Jesus. When the crowds grow and people start to follow him, he's like, "Uh -uh uh-uh-uh, look at him, not me. And so he says, no, the one that's coming behind me, the one that's coming behind me, I'm not even worthy to take off his shoes. And here we are back at feet. You remember a couple weeks ago we talked about feet and you go, that show my feet are killing me? Check it out if you haven't yet. It's really gross. Um, But he's like, the guy that's coming behind me, I'm not even worthy to take his shoes off. Because in those days, people that were rich or kings, they wouldn't take their shoes off because they didn't want to get their hands dirty. That was the job of a slave. And what John is saying is like, I'm not even worthy to be his slave. And he continues and he continues to point at Jesus, the promise of a savior. This promise of a savior, do you know where it started? Genesis chapter three, verse 15, write it down, check it out. But there you get the first promise from God that there would come someone to defeat the enemy and to restore the broken relationship that got messed up in the garden. And all throughout the Old Testament, prophets are saying he's coming, he's coming, he's coming. But Hundreds of years were passed and no Messiah, no redeemer, but now suddenly, Suddenly, God is making good on his promise, and it's in the form of Jesus. God made good on his word when the word became flesh. And, and, and again, sometimes God makes promises, and it takes a long time for us to see them come to fruition. Did you know that? Have you ever just been waiting like, God, you said this, and I just don't see it yet? Great verse to hold on to, Hebrews 10, 36. It says, you have need of endurance, you have need of patience, so that after you have done the will of God, then you can receive the promise. God says, sometimes you got to wait, but he is trustworthy, and he is a promise keeper. And as Jesus comes on the scene, now, now here is the promise kept. It is a major part of the gospel. It is the, the cornerstone of the gospel. But the coming of Jesus was not just God keeping his promise from the past. Jesus becomes the key for us receiving the promises today. I want to show you a verse on the side screens from 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20. It says this. 
For all the promises of God in Jesus are yes and in him amen to the glory of God through us. Because there should be something in you that when you look at the promises of God, you should say, I'm not worthy of that. And guess what? You're not. I'm not. But it's why he says all the promises that God has made you. Now listen, there are some conditional promises in the word of God. If you do this, then God will do that. But there are some glorious and great unconditional ones. If you want to find the best of the best, go to Romans 8 and just spend some time in Romans 8. If God is for us, who can be against us? He's working all things together for good. Sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. And and what can separate us from the love of God? Nothing. But oftentimes when you find those promises, you will also find the phrase, in him, in Christ. And here's what that verse is saying. When we come into a relationship with Jesus, we are now in him. So that when God looks at us, he doesn't see our messiness and our brokenness and our sin. Who does he see? Jesus. Guys, that is insane. I mean, have you ever come to a church service and just felt like, I can't raise my hands today? Things that I've said and done this week? And you are. You are holy and there is no one like you. And I I shouldn't even be allowed to say your name. But in Christ, when we're in Jesus, he's like, I don't see none of that. I see you as I see my son. And all those promises that you feel like you don't deserve, you really don't, but Jesus does, and he did the work for you in his life. And now in him, all the promises I've made are yes and amen. And it's, it's so important. It's such a part of the gospel. And Jesus puts flesh on it for us. Look at verse 9. It came to pass in those days that Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And immediately coming up from the water, he saw the heavens parting and the spirit descending upon him like a dove. Then a voice came from heaven, you are my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Immediately, the spirit drove him into the wilderness. And he was there in the wilderness for 40 days, tempted by Satan, was with the wild beasts And the angels ministered to him. The second point, if you're someone that likes to take notes. Jesus was approved and tested. The order is important because in life most things are tested and approved. But Jesus was approved and tested. Just imagine what it's like. You're out there in the wilderness. You're at the Jordan, and here's John. He's preaching this this message of repentance and being baptized. There's one that's coming. He's going to be greater than me, and then he steps into the scene. And what does John do? We know from John chapter 3, behold the Lamb of God who came to take away the sin of the world. Don't look at me. Look at him. And Jesus walks over, and he says, hey, I want you to baptize me. Now, we don't see the exchange that takes place here. But in Matthew chapter 3, they have this conversation. uh, John's like, you should be baptizing me. But Jesus says, no, no, no. This has to be done to fulfill all righteousness. Have you ever wondered why Jesus had to get baptized? I mean, think of, of the call. The call is, come confess your sins and be baptized. Did Jesus have sin? No. But I've got to tell you, one of the greatest things about our God is that he never calls us to do anything that Jesus didn't do first. And so in Matthew 28, when he's talking to the disciples and he says, go make disciples and do what? Baptize everyone. Let me be clear, baptism doesn't save. Baptism is a symbol of the relationship you have with God. It's very similar to a wedding ring. This tells you that I have a relationship with someone, but if I lose this ring, it doesn't mean that my marriage is over. It's a symbol, but it's still a call. And Jesus says, if if you're going to do it, I'm going to do it first. I'm going to lead the way. But not just as an example, over and over and over again, Jesus is identifying with us. He wants us to be able to relate to him. How great is our God? that he, He just wants us to be able to relate to him. Just like he did when he hung on the cross to pay for sins, he didn't have any sin. But he did it so that he could relate. And then he goes to be baptized and, and for this remission of sins, but, but he didn't have any sin. 
I'll show you this verse in a different translation, Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15. We don't have a high priest who is out of touch with our reality. He's been through weakness and testing, experienced it all, all but the sin. He humbled himself, and he suffered, and he put himself in flesh. And I've, you know, I've made the comparison to that, that show, Undercover Boss, before. Have you guys heard me say that? If you've ever watched Undercover Boss, like, I like that show. At the end, there's this big reveal, like a guy with a bad wig who's actually like the CEO. I'm pretty sure they know. I'm the boss. Ah, and you were working right alongside us. This doesn't compare that he would leave heaven and humble himself like this and suffer and die and, and be humiliated like he did that so that when you suffer, he can relate. I was talking to a brother on Wednesday, and we're talking about a dad whose son took his own life. And I was like, I don't know what that must feel like to lose a son. I don't. But do you know who does? Our Father. The God of the universe allowed himself to feel pain by losing his son, actually giving his son, so that we could relate. So whatever it is that you're going through today, whatever trial you find yourself in, please know you may not find a human being that knows how you feel, but there is a God in heaven who knows how you feel. That's what Hebrews is telling us. And so we see this amazing picture. He gets baptized. The heavens open. The spirit comes down. The voice of the Father. This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. It's a picture of the Trinity. Father, Son, and Spirit, all right there in that moment. But more than a picture of the Trinity, it's a picture of the gospel. Did you see it? Where, where did you see that? This is my Son, in whom I am well pleased. The timing of that statement is so important. Did God tell the Son that because the Son didn't know that? Oh, thanks, Dad. I didn't know you loved me. No, no, no. He said that for our sake. And notice that the father didn't say that to Jesus when he fed the 5,000, when he took some loaves and some fish, and then the father's like, yep, that's my son. Well pleased. He didn't say that when Jesus is casting out demons or healing the blind and the lame. Yep, that's my son. Well pleased in him. He didn't even say that when he was on the cross. He said it at the beginning of his life before he did any of that. Before you do anything, because you're my son, I love you and I'm accepting you. That is the gospel. And we need to realize religion, this is not religion. Religion says work really hard so that you can be loved. The gospel says you are loved. Now go and work really hard. That's the gospel, that in Christ, in a relationship with him, we are loved and accepted. What did he say on the cross? It is finished. There is nothing to add to it. And we have to remind ourselves every single day, there is nothing that you can do to make him love you more. Nothing. If I read my Bible a little bit more, if I'm a little bit nicer to my wife, if I give away some more money, help an old lady cross the street... There's nothing you can do to make him love you more because he loves you perfectly because he loves you like he loves Jesus. Man, sit on that for like 10 minutes sometime. That he loves you like he loves Jesus. But there's also nothing that you have failed to do that would make him love you less. Oh, I blew it this week. I blew it this morning. We were getting ready for church. I yelled at my family. We got in the parking lot. Some guy took my spot. Threw up some hand gestures. I've been trying to shake this bottle, whatever is in that bottle, and I can't put it down. I can't stop looking at that thing on that screen. I keep getting so angry. He, I'm not even going to go to church today because he's got to be upset with me. There is nothing that you have failed to do that would make him love you less. 
You are loved. You are his beloved son and daughter in whom he is well pleased. That's the gospel. Our natural tendency is to slip into legalism because it feels good sometimes. You got your little checklist. You're like, yeah, I read my Bible for 13 hours this week and I gave away extra money and I've actually been fasting for three weeks. And when I worship, I raise both hands. And you feel really good about yourself, but what that actually creates is this spiritual pride to where you look over at the person that's just kind of worshiping like this. Look how low their hands are. (laughs) But the opposite, when you miss those marks, and then you start to feel like, oh man, I'm terrible. There's no, he, he's got, he can't love me now. Religions try to motivate by fear of uncertainty. Got to work really hard. Make sure you're a good person. And then, then maybe you'll be accepted. That's not what our God has done. He motivates us with the certainty of love. And he says, you are loved and accepted. And, and we have to preach the gospel to ourselves every day. He was, before he was tested, he was approved. But don't forget that he was tested. Look again at those two verses, verse 12 and 13. Immediately the spirit drove him into the wilderness. And he was there in the wilderness for 40 days, tempted by Satan, and was with the wild beast, and the angels ministered to him. Who drove him into the wilderness? The spirit. Trick question. Did the spirit know that he was going to be there for 40 days with no food or water and be tempted by the devil? Yeah. And the words are so important. He drove him. He pushed him out into the, into the wilderness, the desert. He compelled him for a time of tempting and testing. Sometimes I think we find ourselves in de- desert experiences and we feel as if God has deserted us. When actually he's the one that put us there. If he, if he put his own son there, who was perfect, why would we think that it couldn't happen to us too? You see, he, he's doing this for our sake. <laughs> I want you to, like, hold on to this. Because some of you are in a desert right now. Sometimes the desert is exactly where God wants us to be. And if you're like in a plush garden right now in life, you're like, yeah, amen, that's right. (laughs) But if you're in the desert, it's kind of a little bit tougher to hold on to. But it's still true. And so he drives them out into the desert. And what is a desert? A desert is a place that's dry, can't sustain life, a place where there's thirst and hunger, a place of loneliness, a place where food runs out. But here's what you also find in deserts. I'll show you a picture if you don't know what it is. A mirage. You see that picture there? Like there's, there's not actually water there. It's the sun reflecting off the sand. But if you were in the desert, you had no food or water. You're like, that's what I need. I need to get there. But the closer you get, you're like, oh, wait, it's really nothing. And so what we find in in desert seasons, we find mirages that kind of appear and disappear. Idols in our life show their true colors. They let us down. Man, if I just, if I can just get into that one school, if I can just get that degree, if I can just get that job, if I can just get this amount of money, if I can just get married. (laughs) Guys, marriage is awesome. But if you're an unhappy single person, you're going to be an unhappy married person. And we set up these idols in our lives that we think will satisfy. If the person that I voted for could just be in the White House. And in the desert, what you see is those things that you thought would really bring you peace and joy. It's like, oh, wait, it's nothing. (laughs) And what you find in the desert is what you really need is God. I would die without Jesus, is what you find in the desert. And sometimes he's got to take you there to teach you that lesson. Nothing else will sustain you like Jesus does. Nothing. Every well will run dry. Every bread will grow moldy except for the bread of life. 
And sometimes you got to go out to the desert to learn that. There's great lessons learned in the desert. I love Psalm 37 where the psalmist says, my thirst, my, my soul thirsts for you. My flesh longs for you like I'm in a desert. You learn to desire God more in the desert. You learn to trust God in the desert. Psalm 23, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. You cannot learn that lesson on the mountaintop. You've got to learn it in the desert. And many times in the Bible, it's where you meet with God. And whether it is Moses or Jacob or Paul or John the Baptist. And so if you ever feel like you're in a desert, do you know who can relate with you? I'm try, we'll try this one more time. If you ever feel like you're in a desert, do you know who can relate with you? Yeah. Jesus. Because he was out there, but he did it more than just to relate with us. He went there to reverse the curse. He went there to pass the test that Adam and Eve failed. You see, Adam and Eve, they faced the same test, but it wasn't as hard. You see, they were in a lush garden with filled bellies, and they had each other, and they were tempted by Satan, and they failed. Jesus says, I'm going to make that right. But I'm going to go out to the desert, and I'm not going to have anything to eat or drink, and it's just going to be me, certainly the Father and the Spirit, but I'm going to face that enemy that defeated them. And the enemy comes... And he tempts Jesus. And, and, and I love, I don't know that I love it, but I think it's great that we can kind of identify Satan's strategies because they're always the same. He's always throwing lies at you to try to get you to believe lies. And so he, he comes to Adam and Eve and, and he says, hey, did God really say that you can't even touch the fruit of this tree when that's not what God said? And what he's trying to get them to believe is God's holding out on you. I know that he says he wants the best for you, but he's really holding out on you. You should take matters into your own hands. Well, they failed. And the enemy comes to Jesus in the desert and he says, aren't you supposed to be the son of God? I mean, if you were really the son of God, would he be letting you suffer like this? And doesn't he do that to us too when we find ourselves in the desert? Where's your father who loves you? who can do all things? How come he's not making all this go away? But Jesus passes the test, and do you, you know what I believe that Jesus is holding on to in that moment when he's questioning the love of the Father? I believe that he's remembering the words that the Father spoke over him at the baptism. Nope, you're my son. You're my beloved son. And in you I am well pleased. And so what do we learn from that? Because so often we fail and fall and we become discouraged in our deserts because we forget the gospel. That we are approved, but we will also be tempted and tried. It's not all rainbows and butterflies, guys. I mean, we've, we've got to realize that. We have to remember that when we're in a desert, we're not God forsaken. We're probably God driven into it. When you're doubting God's love, man, I, I try to communicate this as well. Your circumstances are not the expression of God's love for you. God's love for you is not displayed in your present circumstances. God's love for you is displayed on a cross. So when you find yourself in a desert, you remember the gospel. You remember the cross. You remember the love of Jesus that nothing can separate you from him ever most things in life need to be tested to be approved, but that's not the way that it is in the gospel. We are approved first, and then we are tested. Look at verse 14. Now, after John was put in prison, Jesus came to Galilee, preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God, and saying, the time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Third point. Jesus keeps it real. You're like, what? Where would you get that? Jesus comes on the scene, and he is preaching the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Gospel, good news. Listen, we live in a time when we're all about news. We get to choose which news source we listen to, what feed comes through on our phone, good news, bad news, fake news, and, and, and news has a great influence on us. The gospel of Jesus Christ is good news. Great news. 
Better news than anything you've ever heard. And in life, there's some good news. It's like, oh, we're pregnant, or she said yes, or I got the job, or man, tonight Tom Brady got humiliated at home. Good news. <laughs> That's great news. I'm sorry, I shouldn't have done that. Gospel's good news. Better than any of that, the gospel is that Jesus came to provide salvation for sinners who would put their faith and trust in his life, death, and resurrection. That is good news. It is our key and the gateway to get to heaven, but it's only good news because of the bad news. You have to have balance. You can't have one without the other. And this is where I may offend some of you, especially if you brought a friend. We don't take sin seriously. We don't. And what the Bible tells us is that we all have a problem and it's sin. Romans 3.23, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. None of us are perfect. We all make mistakes. It's a reality. And those sins have separated us from God. And when we're separated from God, what the Bible tells us, we are dead in our sins. And it is a hopeless situation. We are guilty and lost. It's a situation that you can't work your way out of. You can't earn your way out of. It's not like, well, if I do enough good works, no, you're guilty. A murderer standing in a courtroom can't look at the judge and say, well, if I do enough community service, can I get out of this? No. Someone's got to pay. And what we find is that when we sin against God... What we rightfully deserve, it's a place called hell. <gasps> oh, why do you have to say that? Because the Bible does. And I know that it's hard and that we struggle with it. Like, really? You're, you're loving God? There's a place that he sends people for all of eternity in torment to be separated from him? Let me use an example that I've used before. Let's say that tonight, bad news, Tom Brady wins. Bad news. Now, that's bad news. Stop it. And, like, at, so at this point, I'm mad. And I'm walking around my house, and I'm, like, stinking Brady again. And I kick the wall. And now there's a hole in the wall. And, oh, Pastor Chris. Oh, my gosh. We need to pray for you and Shona. Like, I didn't know. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> well, I'm still mad, and I'm walking around. I'm furious. Now my golden doodle walks in front of me. And don't send me emails because I don't kick my dog. <laughs> oh! oh my, someone needs to call the authorities. I can't, you just kicked your dog. My family's mad at me. I go out of the house. I'm like, I just got to go to Publix. And I'm walking in Publix and I'm walking down the aisle. And there's a sweet little old grandma walking down the aisle. And she's got, she's got a Tom Brady jersey on. <laughs> Boom! Now, at that point, I'm going to jail that night. Like, I'm going to jail tonight. And I, I use, like, a funny illustration to just show you something. In every situation, my action was the same. It was a kick. But the object of my action changed from a wall to a dog to a sweet little old perfect grandma. And each time, in your mind, the repercussions and the consequences of that action would get worse, would they not? What do we deserve with just one sin against a perfect and holy God? And even now you're like, I just don't know. And here's the problem, church. We think too highly of ourselves and not highly enough of God. The church in the West, we have lost our fear and reverence of the Lord because we've been living in a dispensation of grace where we know that we're forgiven and Jesus is love and I can just confess and I'm forgiven. We've lost it. And because we've lost it, we're scared to talk about something like hell. But see, if you don't, if you don't wrestle with the bad news, you'll never appreciate the good news. We sing this song, how great the chasm that lay between us, how high the mountain that I couldn't climb. And when you realize that there is a chasm separating you from God that you can't cross and a mountain that you can't get over, it's only then that you will cry out in desperation to God for help. 
But see, sometimes we present the gospel and we don't keep it real. Oh, believe in Jesus so you can go to heaven. No, I'm good. I don't need that. But you haven't told the full story. Jesus comes and he says, repent and believe. It's got to be both. People don't value Jesus and what he did because they don't realize that their sin has separated them from God. And I'm not saying be the crazy person on the corner on a box saying, you're all going to hell. Like, that's wrong too. You know the song Amazing Grace, right? Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. When's the last time you called yourself a wretch? Oh, we don't want to do that because I don't want to feel bad about myself. I once was lost and I was blind. See, it's only when you realize those things about yourself that you can really look at God's grace and say, that is amazing grace. And so notice the two aspects of what Jesus is preaching. Repent. And here's what repentance is. In one sense, it means that you're heading in one direction, and then you realize, no, I need to be going in the other direction. But repentance isn't necessarily linked to action. It's linked to the way that you think. Repentance doesn't mean, oh, i got to clean myself up. i got to get good. got to make myself good. That's not repentance. Repentance is changing the way that you think about sin. For those of us in this room that know Jesus, you remember there was a time when you didn't know him. And you remember when the light switch went off, and you remember when you're like, oh my gosh, the things that I used to do, that's wrong. And I've, I've got to somehow stop doing that. And here's the thing, you can't do it without him. This is just a change of thinking. But if you never repent, I promise you, well, you will never truly believe in the one who came to pay your debt. You have to repent before you can believe. You've got to think differently about sin and be like, I don't want this in my life. And it doesn't mean you become perfect because none of us are perfect. It just means you start to realize I've got a problem and I can't fix myself. It's him. Jesus doesn't come and sugarcoat anything. He keeps it real. The gospel is a double-edged sword. In one sense, it offends, and in the other, it saves. I'm so glad that Jesus was not a negligent physician. He often refers to himself as the great physician. If you went to a doctor and the doctor realized that you had some kind of terminal disease, but they didn't tell you because they didn't want to offend you, in this litigious society, you'd probably sue them. So why do we get affected, offended by a God who says, you've got a problem, but I've got the cure? Why does that offend us? Why are we scared to keep it real? Jesus did. And let me get real with you. Can I get real with you for a second? Is there unrepentant and unconfessed sin in your life, brothers and sisters? The Christian life is one of constant repentance. It's not just that one time when you said the prayer. It's, it's, it's a life of repentance. And sometimes we get so comfortable with sin, and we make excuses for it. We justify it. Part of the gospel is, yes, that you are forgiven, but he sets you free to live a life free from sin. We, we, we set ourselves up to be in bondage, and then we just we want to regard sin in our heart. We treasure it. We don't want anyone to take it from us. God's grace is greater. He's not looking to condemn you or make you feel bad. He simply waits. He's like, would you give that to me? I want to take it from you. Would you give it to me? I'll give you the grace and the strength to walk away from it. Would you give it to me? If there is, man, today, today you can lay that down. You can make a change. Let's close with the last point. It's going to be real quick. Verse 16. And as he walked by the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. Then Jesus said to them, follow me, and I will make you become fishers of men. They immediately left their nets, and they followed him. And when he had gone a little farther from there, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who also were mending their nets. And immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired servants, and they went after him. Last point. Jesus went all in. The gospel is about going all in. Sometimes we look at this passage and we like, oh, the disciples were so amazing. Look how they left everything to follow Jesus. 
That's pretty cool. I'm more amazed at the sacrifice of Jesus who left heaven to hang out with 12 clowns for three years. <laughs> like, seriously, he didn't have to do that. But he's like, let me show you what the gospel looks like. The gospel is going all in. And I think for a lot, and man, I heard Pastor David Platt this week talking about something on the radio. He's got a new book out and just reminded me of just the scariest section of Scripture, Matthew 7. Many people will stand before me. Jesus is talking to the disciples. Many people in that day will stand before me, the last day. And they, they will say to him, Lord, Lord, here we are. We're ready to come into heaven. Didn't we prophesy in your name and we did many wonders in your name and we cast out demons in your name and we went to Calvary Plantation on Sundays in your name and we wore a get in the story shirt in your name and I owned a Bible in your name and he looks at them and he says, depart from me. I never knew you. I'm not trying to scare you, but this week I've been scared for you. It's easy to come to church. It's easy to play church. Have one foot in. I'll give Jesus my Sundays for an hour and a half. In fact, Chris, you're going long today. Like, can you wrap this up? It's Super Bowl Sunday. How come we're only willing to give him so much when he gave us his all? And there's something really scary to think of the word that he uses in those verses, many. You don't have the view that I have from up here. And it, it hurts my heart to think that there may be many in this church who think that because we go to church on Sunday that we're going to be good with God on the last day. It scares me. And because of that, I'm willing to take the risk to offend. Because at that point, and this might sound weird, there's no more grace. There's no more opportunities. Oh, no, no, no now I want to get right with you, God. Like, now I'm willing to give you my all. No, 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 you had your chance. Have you gone all in? And Bob Barnes comes here like once a year and teaches on Father's Day, and he always says, all in, if you know Bob Barnes, all in. Are you all in? And so here's how we're going to end. I'm going to have the worship team come out. And if you could all close your eyes for a second and just get alone with your father for a moment. And maybe you fall into one of those two camps. You're like, yeah, you know what? There is something in my life, a sin that I have held on to for far too long. And I haven't repented of it because I'm enjoying it. I can't shake it. But I haven't necessarily given it to him. I need to repent. This is not to condemn you. This is not to give you a picture in your mind of a father with arms that are crossed and angry. I want you to consider the picture of the son with his arms spread out. Because the Bible says it's the goodness of God that will lead you to repentance, not his anger or his wrath, though those are real. Sometimes we get callous to sin. We're not sensitive to it anymore. It shouldn't be so. Or maybe you're someone that says, you know, I haven't been all in with Jesus. I want you to realize he didn't just save you to get to heaven. He saved you so that you could live a full life here and now with him and for him. But in both of these things, he will never, ever, ever force you. He will simply say, through the gospel, you're my son and my daughter, and I love you, and I'm pleased with you. 
Now based upon how much I love you, will you be willing to let these things go? Will you be willing to give me your whole life? Will you stop keeping things from me? Will you stop compartmentalizing your faith to an hour and a half on a Sunday morning? I want you to go all in. And here's the crazy thing, he went all in for you. So if that's you, and it's like, yeah, I've got this sin, I gotta repent, or no, today I gotta go all in. I'm not gonna ask you to come forward. I'm just gonna ask you to stand up so that we can pray for you. And, and eyes closed, guys, like this isn't about anyone else in this room, this is about you and your father. And acknowledging anything that he's doing in your heart this morning, not about my voice, his voice. If you're like, you know what, that's me. I gotta lay this down or I gotta go all in. And not if you hear chairs moving or someone else, this is about you. And this is not about shame. This is about humility saying, I need the help of my dad. He won't give it if you don't ask. You can't go all in without his help. You can't repent without his help. We can't do anything without his help. And if you wanna hold on to it and try to figure it out on your own, I love you, but good luck. And this is a work of God like this. I, I, can't, I can't make you do this and I don't want to make you do this between you and him. Father, we thank you that we can even stand before you. We've known and we've read of times when a sinful people have tried to stand before you and, and they've been wiped out because you're holy and perfect and pure and we're not and yet today we have great grace. We are loved and we are accepted because of Jesus. And so we thank you for the gospel. We thank you for the good, the great, the glorious news that he came to rescue, save, and redeem. To set us free from sin. To give us heaven. And I just want to pray right now for my brothers and sisters, your sons and daughters that are standing up. And Father, you know their hearts. And you know what they're wrestling with and going through. You know if repentance needs to be given. You know if there needs to be a greater love and desire for you that leads them to go all in. Father, I pray now that whatever their need is, that you would grant it to them in Jesus' name. That you would pour out your Holy Spirit in a fresh way upon them. That everything that is in their life that is preventing them from getting closer and seeing you more clearly, that you would incinerate it now in Jesus' name. I pray for godly sorrow that leads to repentance. I pray for clearer vision of Jesus so that they would see him as their treasure and their all in all, the only one worthy of living for. God, thank you. Thank you that you're a God of second, third, fourth million chances. And Jesus, thank you for making all of that possible by taking our place. And so, Lord, we, we thank you that we can stand before you with peace and joy and confidence. Confidence to start again. Confidence to go all in. And to know that in all of it, we don't go alone. But Jesus, you're with us. And we are a family. We do this together. Strengthen us, Lord. We love you. Help us to be to the world as Jesus was to us. Pictures of the gospel, pictures of the good news. God, use us for that, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.